Good morning. My name is Daniel Jones, and I am the CHCI Clinical Phillips Public Policy Fellow. I'm delighted to be with you today for this STEM education and Latino student session. I graduated from Bridgewater College with a Bachelor's of Science in Biology, and I loved the subject from the first moment I took it in high school. It led me to opportunities to work on and lead various independent research projects, ranging from bacteriophage isolation and analysis to genome splicing and protein characterization. I remember being in my bio classes, looking around, and realizing that no one in this space, including faculty, looked like me or could relate to me and my experiences. It truly warms my heart to see this conversation being emphasized because I can say that as a Latino in STEM, we need more Latinos in STEM. It is now my honor to introduce uh, welcoming video remarks from the chair of this panel, Senator Alex Padilla. Senator Alex Padilla is the first Latino to represent California in the US Senate. He was appointed in January 2021 to complete the Senate term of now Vice President Kamala Harris. Senator Padilla serves as chairman of the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Immigration, Citizenship, and Border Safety. He is a member of the Senate Committees on Budget, Environment and Public Works, Homeland Security and Government Affairs, Judiciary, and Rules. Uh, Senator Alex Padilla. Hi, I'm Senator Alex Padilla, and I have the honor of representing California in the United States Senate. As the first Latino to represent California in the Senate, I'm keenly aware of how much we need diversity in the institutions that shape our society. I'm also a proud graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where I earned my degree in mechanical engineering. So I know firsthand the value of a STEM education. I want to open opportunities for Latino students in STEM because the critical thinking and problem-solving skills they learn are valuable in any career, and because we need more Latinos in STEM jobs. According to the Pew Research Center, no group faces a larger representation gap in STEM jobs, and that in turn contributes to pay gaps for Latinos, and it affects our national competitiveness. Diversity in the research environment drives scientific discovery. That's why I'm supporting a government-wide push to increase equity in STEM education. A more diverse STEM pipeline is key to maintaining America's leadership in innovation. I've advocated for funding to improve STEM education at Hispanic-serving institutions and to build new partnerships between top research universities and minority-serving institutions. I'm also working to ensure that federal departments and agencies like NASA prioritize equity in their outreach and engagement efforts. Finally, I'm working to support college affordability reforms so that students can focus on earning their degrees without fear of hunger or eviction. I'm a proud co-sponsor of the College for All Act, which would guarantee tuition-free community college for all students and allow students from families earning under $125,000 a year to attend public colleges and universities tuition-free and debt-free. It would also guarantee that students from low- and middle-income families can attend public and private nonprofit minority-serving institutions tuition-free and debt-free. Expanding access to higher education is the first step for many to making the American dream more attainable for all. I will continue working to ensure that all students can access quality, affordable higher education and to build Latino leadership in the STEM sector. Thank you, Senator Padilla, for your remarks. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Bertha Otto. Bertha Otto is the Executive Director of Great Minds in STEM, a national organization that promotes the study and pursuit of careers in science, technology, engineering, and math, especially in underserved communities. Founded in 1989, the Great Minds in STEM programs promote college readiness by providing academic and STEM identity support, networking and professional development opportunities, and employer access focused on STEM careers, pathways. She initially joined Great Minds in STEM as a corporate and government relations manager, and from there progressed up to the director of business development, and was most recently promoted to executive director. Please join me in welcoming Bertha Otto.
Thank you, James, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to Senator Alex Padilla, my senator in California, and uh, so proud to have him there. I, I have to share that Alex, Senator Padilla, actually started a pipeline from MIT back to San Fernando Valley. And I personally have a lot of friends that actually grew up in the San Fernando Valley and attended MIT because of Senator Padilla's outreach. And so that's, that's a great legacy that he has. I'm excited to be here at this session. And um, I get the honor of, of welcoming all of our expert panelists here. So I'm going to start with Dr. Christopher Hernandez. Christopher is an engineering professor and scientist. He currently serves as the professor at Sibley School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. He is also an adjunct scientist at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, New York. In 2022, he was named a Bright Fellow by the National Science Foundation for his groundbreaking work integrating biological systems with engineering materials. He has leveraged this position at an Ivy League institution and a top 10 ranked mechanical engineering program to promote the success of Latinos in science, engineering, and higher education. In 2021, Dr. Hernandez was named the Educator of the Year by the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. Next, Karina Colot. Karina is a professor, prof process engineer at Micron and has been interested in nanotechnology since high school and loves getting to work on technology that impacts everyone around the world. She started with Micron in 2019 after graduating with a master's in engineering in microelectronic manufacturing engineering from Rochester Institute of Technology and is the lead in her group. She serves on the Micron Hispanic Professional Employee Resource Group Steering Committee and is passionate about learning about different cultures and volunteering in the community. And please welcome Ricardo Stephens II. Rico is, diver is the diversity campus manager for Dell Technologies. His mission is to be an advocate for underrepresented minorities and is a champion for creating safe spaces for diverse thought and conversation. He has been with Dell Technologies since 2012 and has held various roles in tech space within the organization. Rico serves as a co-chair for the Black Networking Alliance and the business development chair for Gen Next, two employee resource groups with Dell that drive professional development and networking opportunities for those in need. And for all the participants here, please tweet your comments at hashtag CHCI Summit. With, with Great Minds in STEM, we have just launched recently our state of STEM for our, for our nation. We already knew prior to the pandemic that Latino students were lagging behind in the core subjects of math and science. This was before the pandemic. The pandemic has only exasperated the need to upskill, the need to really pivot and adjust how we bring capacity building back to the K-12 communities. And so we, we get to have this dialogue and hear from our expert panelists. And so to begin with today's dialogue, I want to ask an initial question uh, of each of the panelists, and I'll start with you, Dr. Chris. How did you become involved with STEM? So uh, uh, thank you, Brett. Um, I was always interested in science and engineering and technology. Probably, I think I read too many comic books as a child. And, um, and really just got engaged in high school through the public high school and the gifted and talented programs in my hometown of Fresno, California. And, uh, and that led me to, to move forward and move forward and become what I am today, which is uh, uh, somebody who literally teaches rocket science to Ivy League students. Uh, so I started uh, young when my parents got a desktop, desktop computer at home. They didn't quite know how to use it, and so they told me, figure it out. So I did, and after that, I was like amazed by this box that had so many components, and you know, there was all these moving parts interfaced, and we could you know, use it to learn so much more. 
So that's how I got involved. Similar to you, uh, I had a dad that gave me a computer, said, hey, go learn how to build it, tear it down, play games. And ever since then, kind of been stuck with the bug. Got away from it for a little bit, went to school to be a comms major, but came back after a, a failed attempt to try to be like an a and for a record label. Oklahoma doesn't have much of that going on. So I was like, you know what, I need to get back into STEM, and here we are. Excellent. What traits, I'll start with you, Rickle. What, what traits as an employer are you looking for in the STEM workforce? So a little bit of both, right? You've got to have that foundation in education, right? And it's super important. But also those transferable skills, right? And I think that as a minority, we have the strong work ethic. We have the resiliency and we have those things. We deserve to be in the room. So if you marry that with those STEM fields, those are the things that are going to get you in the door, get you picked up, and have you be part of those conversations. So that would be my answer. Karina? So, I mean, Micron really believes in the diversity of thought, and that translates to diversity in your background. So we really believe that strong collaboration skills, which is one of our values, and that knowledge of STEM and being able to problem solve complex solutions, create some uh, complex problems to create long-term solutions uh, is really what we're looking for. And communication is so important. I work with so many other departments to create the memory uh, products that we do. And if I wasn't able to get my ideas across and have them actually understand what I'm trying to get across, uh, we wouldn't get anywhere. So, um, you know, I'm a university professor. I'm recruiting students to be college students. I'm recruiting students to be PhD students in my laboratory. And of course, we're interested in the math and we're interested in the science and we're interested in the resilience because in engineering and technology, failure is the norm and you get used to that and you, you fail and then you get better. And so those, that's, those are the skill sets we're looking for. And I guess I want to make a pitch to anybody here who's not already in the choir is um, right in the last 30 years, we've been soaking up great engineering and science talent from overseas. We've been recruiting these people to come here, study at our universities, and then lead our engineering and technology. And increasingly, those people have great options in their home countries, and they're not going to move. And so we need the homegrown talent, and that's some of the people in this room, to do these things. And the nation needs those people to fill those jobs in science and technology. Absolutely. That drives our economy. <laughs> Absolutely. Rico, I'm going to start with you again for this next question. What specific goals and metrics does your organization use for STEM diversity? So Dell Technologies, we have what we call our 2030 moonshot goals, uh, specifically the cultivating inclusion goal, where by 2030, we want to have 50% of our workforce be women, 40% of those women be people leaders, and 25% of our workforce be African American, Latinx, and 15% of those being people leaders as well. So my team is actually changing the face of tech, and it was created because of this program, right? And I go and specifically create talent attraction strategies at minority serving institutions. I have four HSIs, one HBCU that I manage relationships with. So that's just one of the things that we do. We also put out our DNI reports. We did it before all of the things that came up over the last couple of years. So we've been doing the work, uh, and we're seeing the results. Excellent. Thank you. Karina. So I have some notes because I'm not exclusively in DEI. <laughs> so uh, we do have a DEI report that we put out every year, uh, just like most companies. And one of our commitments is to increase the un representation of the underrepresented gr groups. Uh, so we actually also have AI technology that helps us write inclusive uh, job postings, and I'm pretty proud to say that we actually do anonymous resumes. So we uh, remove the names to remove that, you know, unconscious bias that we know exists. And um, we also have a team of ally uh, hiring uh, members. So we have people that sit in on area view panels and make sure that they're keeping the hiring manager in check uh, for and checking for any unconscious bias. So, for example, if there is a 
person that interviews and is constantly looking down, seems reserved and shy, and the hiring manager says, no, we can't hire that person, they're not fit for the position, the uh, inclusive ally uh, in the panel can come in and say, well, have you looked at what kind of culture they come from? Maybe the culture they come from is respectful to look down, be more reserved. That doesn't mean that they don't have the technical knowledge that is needed. It's just that's their way of showing respect. So we thought that that was extremely important to have in our hiring panels. Uh, and then... Um, like you said, we have HBCUs and HSIs that we partner with, and we're looking to get more talent from there as well. Excellent. Thank you. Chris, so, based on your... Oh, go ahead. Please, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I, I want your question. Oh, I was going <laughs> to ask, based on your National Science Foundation Fellowship, mm -hmm. how do we increase participation in STEM by Latinos? Yeah. Yeah, so um, if, you, if you review the data on the, from the National Science Foundation, they, they put these reports on number of degrees in science and engineering in the nation. And if you look at, at the trends that have been going on, and I, I know engineering because that's what I focus on. And in engineering, we've, we've seen some great improvements in Latinos in STEM. Now, about 11% of the engineering degrees in 2018 were granted to Latinos, um, Hispan with Hispanics and Latinos. And of course, we'd like to reach parity, which means the number of engineering degrees is, it matches the national population. And of course, that's a moving target, right? Because uh, uh, Latinos are the fastest growing uh, segment of the US population. And so if you, the one way I've been thinking about it is by 2040, and I think I will retire by 2040, something like that, um, it's estimated that 23% of the United States population will be Hispanic Latino. And so we'd like to reach that 23% of the engineering graduates in 2040 would also be Hispanic Latino. And um, to do that, I, I'm an engineer, so I did the math. To do that, we need an increase in engineering degrees granted to Latino students by 10.5% per year. And if we reach that by 2040, we will have parity and we will no longer be underrepresented, we will be represented. And um, you might think 10.5% per year sounds large, but between 2012 and 2017, the average was 12%. So this is something that is doable. It dipped again in 2018. That's the, the latest data I have. But hitting that 10.5% is doable. It's going to take some effort, but we could do it. And, um, and so that's something I'm really, really excited about. And I think this is, this is something we could all do together. Absolutely. And our nation needs that. <laughs> Yes. When it comes to public-private partnerships, we know that that yields strong results when everyone has buy-in, everyone invests in a community. Rico, can you share some examples? Yeah, no, I can share one that actually I personally do. So being a co-chair for the Black Networking Alliance, Oklahoma City, I work with a lot of schools in the area. And this last year, we started a reading program at a school that's you know, in an area that's kind of impoverished, right? Uh, and it went well, but we figured out how can we do more? How can we get connected? How can we prepare students for STEM, right? And so uh, this year we're going to go into it and we're going to read from STEM books and we're going to sponsor a STEM spelling bee at the elementary school. Then at the middle school, we're going to help do coding and things like that, robotics, so they can be prepared, right? So then in high school, we can do the last piece, which is the professional development. Let's show you how to build a resume. Let's show you how to build your brand. Let's show you how to interview, right? So by the time they graduate, they've had 10 plus years of touches from Dell, touches with STEM, and they get familiar and comfortable with it because I think that's probably where the biggest opportunity is, right? I know when I was little, nobody was talking about going into STEM fields. We were talking about sports, being a rapper, even though I was offbeat, I was trying. Uh, and so just to get in there early, advocate, show them that they deserve to be in these conversations and in these rooms uh, is, is a huge start. And that's one thing that I'm doing. Karina? So Micron is uh, partnering with uh, elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. Uh, we have employees go in and talk to them about STEM-related fields. We do mock interviews. We do uh, resume building. We do... See what else we do breakfasts with engineers we do job shadowing with for high schoolers 
Uh, we do, let's see, uh, some women in tech and summer chip camps where we have over the summer uh, provide materials for like circuits and stuff like that where they can build and see really the uh, science at work. Uh, and there's, we partner with a boys and girls club in the area as well. Where uh, Micron is, is in Manassas, Virginia, and there is a 68% population is Hispanic in Manassas. So we really try to cater to the schools locally to make sure that we're uplifting uh, those people there. Dr. Chris? So um, the, the work we do in the high schools and, and the elementary schools is absolutely key. If the students aren't prepared by, they get, by the time they get to college, I can't turn them into engineers and scientists. Um, although where I am sitting, because I'm not in the, in the secondary schools, is looking at what happens at the university once the students arrive. And I'm spending time thinking about what we can do to ensure their success and keep them from leaving science and engineering into another field. And uh, what I'm focusing on right now are the faculty. Um, there are so few Latino faculty in this country. A few years ago, the faculty in the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers did a survey. It's about 4% of the engineering faculty in the United States are Latino, and of those, only 10% are born in the 50 states. So uh, most of the talent is being imported from Latin America. And that can, be, can make a huge difference for the students. I don't know about the undergraduates, because I don't think anyone's done the study, but for the graduate students, who gets a PhD, who continues on as a scientist, um, it has been shown, a paper was just published a few months ago showing that at looking at everything, like the size of their department, who's in their department, all this other kinds of, all this data, who the person is, male, female. If you want a member of an underrepresented group to finish a PhD and become a scientist, the most influential thing is, is their mentor also a member of an underrepresented group? The effect is massive, a two times effect size. If the mentor um, is an underrepresented minority, that person is two times more likely to continue on in science than if their mentor is white or Asian. And so I'm look, thinking about ways of, of improving access, increasing that number of Hispanic faculty and Latino faculty in the engineering. But not only are they serving as role models, but they're defining what it takes to be an engineer or scientist. And so they're establishing the academic um, uh, curriculum as well. And so that's something that I've been working on a lot um, through the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, but also through professional networking. And I think that's a, a key linchpin that we, that we haven't been able to, to leverage yet to solve this problem. And to add to that, I think it also starts in high school and elementary schools. Yeah. If they don't see the representation there, they won't continue. Yeah. Absolutely. They have to have viable role models that look like them. Yeah. Um, you just touched upon the importance of mentors. Can you each share a specific mentor that helped you along your way and has helped you give back? I can, uh, I can kick it off. So I had a mentor, and I'll keep it real. There was a time where I was not the best employee at Dell. I probably should have been fired, <laughs> right? But I had a mentor who looked like me, who saw the potential that I had, and was like, hey, you have the potential to be here, but if you don't fix this, you're going to be out of here. And he supported me, but at the same time, he held me accountable. Um, and I got it together, didn't lose my job, and now, fast forward, I've gone and I work for him. That's my, that's my leader now. So to come from somewhere where he saw me at my worst to now him trusting me to be in a position where I can be successful, do what I love, this is my passion to go out and teach people, hey, we deserve to be here. And it's okay, like you said, Chris, resiliency is key. And I think as a minority, resiliency is something that we have in spades, right? Um, so it's something that will help you get in the door. And I've seen people, when they fail, instead of going and fix it or admit it, they'll quit their job. Um, and so, yeah, that was just my mentor, and that's my story. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Karina? I don't know if I've had anybody that, like, I would say, like, is a specific mentor, but I guess recently I have uh, started... Um, a, more of a relationship with somebody in at Micron who has uh, you know, quite a couple more years of experience than I do. And 
in my current role, there is a couple of things that I don't really like anymore, I guess. And then he's pushing me. He goes, okay, well, you know, you're a great engineer. You, you know, d deserve to be here. What about looking at another role within the company? And he's really pushing me. He's like, you got what it takes. And so now I'm really like getting there and looking to move. But uh, without him, I don't know if I would have worked up the courage to, to really move. So I'm excited for what comes next. So I, I've had several spectacular mentors in my career. Um, I'll, I'll mention, you know, one of them was my high school teacher, public high school teacher. He taught calculus. And he was the, the person who sort of encouraged me to think uh, beyond, you know, local institutions and to sort of think nationwide when I was looking for college and thinking about careers. And um, he actually had a PhD in physics and he was back teaching in high school, uh, high school math. And he's just a very influential guy and, um, and really had a great influence on me. So um, it, it's, it's that looking out for people who are talented and people who are, who are thinking and giving them opportunities. That's, that's what I've seen as a clear, as a, a key part of, of my experience. And I'm, I'm trying to do that with my students every day. Awesome. Definitely um, mentors that help guide and push you and, and see the best in you and, and help to sharpen your skills. That's, that'll help along the way. The digital transformation and data literacy have continued to grow rapidly. What, what can we do to help Latino students to have access and build their competencies? I'll start with you. Okay, so um, I think it starts, or it needs to start early with the data literacy. I think in the future, everybody is gonna be expected to write computer code, scripting. That's just gonna be expected. I'm already seeing it when I talk to biologists. I'm like, oh, a biologist, and they're like, and they're coding up and doing scripting. And I thought that was an engineer thing, but the biologists are doing it because they need to. And I think that's a key part. It needs to start early. And the amazing thing is the basic stuff, learning the basics does not require fancy computers. It requires you know, a hundred dollar you know, Raspberry Pi kind of thing to, to learn those basics. It just takes the time to, to gain that experience. And I, I think probably um, the other speakers will tell you that. And that's, uh, that's what leads to success and being able to, to look at that at an early stage and be able to toy around with that technology. Karina? Um, I really do think that it starts you know, young. You know, with uh, the way Micron has been partnering with elementary schools and middle schools, getting the word out there that STEM is a possibility, having uh, people from Micron go and talk to them about what they do, and sponsoring events uh, is really important. You know, it's, um, like you said, coding is everywhere, and it's really needed at all parts. Yeah, I would say that it's, it's necessary. That's the long and short. You have to accept and understand that everything is going digital. You have to have some knowledge of that in today's workforce. And it's only going to get increasingly more important to have those skills. Uh, like they've said, early engagement is key. Uh, and you just have to, we just have to show that, hey, you have a place. This is cool. Uh, and make it cool. Because if somebody, when I was young, would have said, hey, this is the way that you need to go. This is the future. And I would have been like, OK, maybe I'll take an opportunity to, to learn more about it instead of being 27 and jumping into Dell at that point, right? And that was really my first big foray into STEM there because I was a communications major. I, I want if to, if you don't mind, I'd like to just comment again. Uh, again. I, this is, I, I said this. This is great. It would be great if we thought even further ahead. Like right now, data science is big. But if we're talking about a high school student now, what's going to be big when they finish college? You know, Bill Gates became Bill Gates because he was playing with computers in the 70s before computers were a thing, right? Mark Zuckerberg became Mark Zuckerberg because he was toying around with the internet before it became a thing, right? What can we do to get ahead of that curve and prepare our students for the technology that's going to be really big in five to seven years? And if we can do that, Latinos won't just be uh, reach parity. We will be in the lead. And so to the degree we can do that, and these are things that maybe I don't even know, um, but uh, one technology right now is a biotechnology is about to spin out and be huge. And, um, and if we can be an end on the ground floor of the biotechnology revolution that's coming, 
um, we, will be in, we will be in the lead. The next Bill Gates will have a, a Spanish surname. It's about time. We need that. <laughs> we need that. No, that's amazing. It almost sounds like data literacy is the new language. When we think about bilingual, it is multilingual. That includes understanding and, and grasping what that is and how to build it. We've already touched upon the fact that the Hispanic population is the fastest growing in absolute numbers, yet we're the second lowest in the STEM workforce. We do critically, as a nation, have a sense of urgency. What programs can we invest in to increase our STEM talent capacity building? Okay, so I already stole the, the soapbox on this one. I think we're doing spectacular things with the high school students and the secondary school students. We have some great things for the college students. I think if we can get people who are, who are in the lead and can help provide an environment for those students as they go through. You know, I like to tell people, um, the first time I went to an engineering class that was taught by a Hispanic or Latino professor, I was super nervous. It was the first time I was giving a lecture in front of the classroom, okay? So uh, if we could have a, just a few more numbers like that, we, I think we can really make a difference because we have these great programs for the high school students and we, we have robotics programs for the high school students and the elementary school students. We're getting them engaged. We just need to be able to give them that path to move beyond that step. Karina? I'll echo the educators are really important. Uh, we actually have uh, tours at Micron for the educators to make sure that they're starting the conversations in the classroom saying, well, we know what Micron does. Uh, this, is, this is STEM, you know, and that then they can translate to the classroom. It's super important for that representation and knowledge to be there. Yeah, I'm going to piggyback off of that. We're actually doing something very similar at Dell where we're trying to have educators come learn about our technology, learn about the things that we're doing, and then take that back to the students. Uh, I partner with a lot of the student organizations like SHIP, uh, NSBE, uh, the Hispanic Business Student Association, right, and partner there and invest there with like case competitions, hackathons, and things like that to show that, hey, we are invested in what you're doing. We see you. We're here to advocate for you. Just come on the train. And, and I'll, I'll add one last thing. You know, when I was, I was talking about the bio revolution, there is a thing for high school students called iGEM. I'm not involved in it yet. I'd like to be. But it's called iGEM, and it's all about bioengineering. And there are high school competitions. And just imagine if there was a high concentration of iGEM comp competitors coming from our predominantly Hispanic high schools and middle schools. Um, it would give all those kids a, a huge leg up. If you could suggest one policy change that would make a significant difference in increasing STEM education, what would it be? I, I think we, we need to boost the number of, of Latinos who are finishing with doctoral degrees. And I think there are some great programs out there to do that. The Sloan Foundation has been supporting doctoral students at institutions throughout the country. And so these, are, these have some partial financial support, but also mentoring supports. And also, the grants are, grant, are given to the institutions based on the institution's willingness to provide an excellent environment for those students. And so that was, that, you know, a program like that or support of programs like that is something that I would, I would think is key. Excellent. Karina? I think back to the educators, uh, student loan repayment for those who go into uh, STEM teachings. It's super important, you know, again sound like a broken record, repeating the representation is important. You know, if we have those people who uh, wouldn't have been able to do it without that help, you know, we need them. Uh, long, short answer, money. We, we need more help in those schools that are underfunded. Um, you know, just because you can't afford to live in a school that has all this new and fancy equipment doesn't mean that you don't deserve the opportunity to go and work with that kind of equipment, learn and get connected with people like on this panel, right? Uh, so I would say that's probably the biggest thing is that we need to figure out how we truly get equity and not just equality where it's based on taxing from the local community. Are there any questions from the audience members?
uh, an accolade to everyone on the panel because uh, um, as a mom, um, I was really focused on what was best for my children. And so I read about American Academy of Pediatrics and screen time and not allowed to do this or that. Um, so we limited a lot of tech, I guess, to our children. But we realized um, that if they love video games, uh, how about you make them? So we had to seek out coding for five-year-olds and four-year-olds, and, and they've been doing that for the last three years. They're on Java. Like they, they're so excited about it. But we pay a lot of money for that. But Rico, you're saying that you're actually providing those services in your community. And, and it is so easy because it's a room full of computers um, and then people just kind of guiding the kids along. Um, so if we could have that um, in our community where every company like Dell, HP, or any other one would donate that time back, my kid who's obsessed with comics, robotics, and coding, and he's six, we can get him to be the engineer that you know we want to, to reach that parity. Or my daughter who's obsessed with art um, and biology could work on uh, micron technology type of um, atmosphere. So funding, huge, and people like you giving back to our community is, is huge. So thank you for that. I love it. It's what I do. <laughs> Thanks. Over there. Well, while we're moving to the other speaker, you know, it's sometimes so hard to get those computer science classes. I can teach my son the basics, but, you know, um, what's the right way of putting it? He doesn't want to take a whole computer science class from me. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? And fight, get, I have to fight tooth and nail to get, you know, once he reached that next level to get him into the class. And uh, I can just imagine what it's like for somebody who's not an engineer and who isn't an Ivy League professor. How do they get their kids into that? Yeah. Hello, my name is Geraldine. Um, so aside from there being a gap in Latino students, there's also a gap in like Latino women. In STEM, is there anything specific you've seen that's worked to increase uh, the interest for Latino women in STEM? So Micron partners with uh, SWE. We go to their, uh, SWE is Society of Women Engineers. We go to their conferences to pull talent from there. We also have various programs that we work with in the community, like Girls Going Tech for eighth graders or Women in STEM. We also just finished our second annual uh, women mentoring program where we had students from over 100 universities with, I think, 46 mentors from the company uh, for eight weeks. And we taught them about what it means uh, to be in the industry and um, getting them more involved. Uh, it really does start you know, at the elementary level. If we can get them interested then and keep that interest, which is the problem, you know, there's studies that say that uh, in elementary school or middle school, the interest of women and uh, men, boys are the same. But what happens along the way? How do we keep them involved? Mm -hmm. So that I think that's where it's important to focus on. Yeah. Well, I guess, and also, if, like, not if you don't start earlier, young, like, are there any other ways to get more women involved or engaged? I would say yes, and yeah. I see that in those. In you know, I went and worked with some bi microbiologists for one year on sabbatical, and they were all scripting. And so these are people who probably did not start their start thinking about computer programming and engineering as, as children, and they but they ended up picking it up because that's what they needed. That's what they were passionate about. And so I think there are those there are those paths for people. And I've, I've seen a lot of great progress in terms of women in engineering in the last few years. I know Cornell is very proud that uh, two years ago our our entering class was for, for the first time over fifty percent women. And so uh, we're starting to see uh, 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 parity in women and men in engineering programs. And so uh, if, if we can keep that momentum up, um, we're going we're gonna to get there. Thank you. She's earning her steps today. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this incredible sharing all of your experiences. I really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone else does, too. Um, my name is Tanya, and I was a pre-medical student undergrad, went on to do public health in my master's. I adjacent to STEM, somewhat STEM, but um, 
in taking all my classes, I think what I really appreciate is the emphasis so far on how do we recruit people to these fields. I'm also interested in how do we retain people, um, because both in the workplace or in academia, because I know that, um, at least in the experience of the pre-medical sort of coursework, there are a lot of weed-out classes, and I, I felt very fortunate I was able to complete it, and I felt very um, fulfilled in my, in my sort of STEM career um, in academia, but I saw many students who couldn't do it or couldn't, not because they weren't capable, but because they didn't have sufficient investment in them. So how do you keep people um, in the field, um, whether it's in the academic institution or whether it's in the workplace? So I think uh, advocacy is super important. Most people leave their manager, not the company that they're with, right? And so I was a hiring manager before I became a campus manager, right? So I had women on my team. I had two women that were hairdressers before they came to Dell. No technical background, nothing, right? And they were scared to jump out there and try to get these other jobs or go shadow. And I made it my business to be their biggest cheerleader and their biggest supporter, right? And show them that their experience helps, not that it doesn't hinder them, it helps them, right? And that goes for women, minorities, all of us, right? Where you show that your differences actually give you a different insight, right? Uh, and I took those two women and now they're technical leads where they train people to do technical work, right? And that's the biggest thing for me. Now, as far as uh, company-wide, we do need to make sure that we're putting our leaders through like inclusive leadership and understanding that there is unconscious bias and how to work through it and how to pay attention and know it's there. Um, and we're doing things like that, uh, but it does start at that direct manager uh, being that advocate, being that cheerleader, being that moral support for that person. And I'll chime in, you mentioned the weeder classes, right? I was that guy who was teaching one of those classes and I was not happy with the outcomes at the end of the class, so I changed the way I taught. And I integrated this thing called active learning, instruction, lots of the clicker questions and discussions between the students. The content was the same, but when I switched to that, all the students did better. And then the grade distribution, where the women and the members of underrepresented minorities were, was sort of evenly distributed, the same way you would expect based on the overall population of the class. And so sometimes it's, it's sort of how we're teaching and the environment we create in that classroom that, that allows success by everybody. And that's true inclusion. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, Echoing Tanya, thank you so much for this panel. I, uh, it, it's just been really wonderful. Uh, I wanted to can I ask a little bit of a general question, kind of pick your brains. Uh, I think that uh, one of the kind of biggest things that keep people out of STEM sometimes when you're talking to kids, I know I hear it when I talk to like my little brother and his friends, right, is like, when am I going to use this STEM stuff in, you know, my regular everyday life? You know, like I'm never going to have to use calc, right, or something like that. Um, and so even like just hearing about your experiences, right, and when you think about academia, you still get the opportunity to do research and to, you know, publish things, and, and you're still involved in, in the private sector, right, and with these companies, there's still ways to merge that STEM with you know, literally your everyday life, right, and just realizing all the opportunities that there are in STEM fields to, to do things, right, the different places, it's not just grading papers or, you know, just like building little things, right, there are just so many ways to be dynamic in it, and I kind of want to hear just what you guys have to say about how do you help people kind of realize the, how dynamic STEM is as a field and like what really your opportunities and options are in that field because it's not just about being in the lab, right? Like you get the opportunity to work with so many people. Like everyone in this panel really gets that human interaction too. So if you could just speak to that, that would be really cool. Go ask your parents how to use a TikTok, right? And you're gonna understand like, okay, it's already in everything that we do, right? Like that's where we have to make it simplified and understand like you're working with the tech already. Uh, you're doing these things already. You just have to put a title to it and put go get the, the formal training and that formal education to go with it, right? And marry the two. I think that's just the simplest way to put it, uh, just to show that it's already a part of your everyday life, everything that you do, and it's only gonna get more and more tied in there. Yeah. Um, Micron makes memory chips, right? We put memory in literally everything, in our cameras, in our phones, in our cars, with all the smart systems. Uh, all electronic, all electronics, you know, the greeting cards that play the little song, you know, there's a little memory chip in there to store the song. So I think awareness, making sure that people understand that there's so many behind the scenes um, 
technologies that they can contribute to. You know, Micron is also in medical devices. Uh, for people who say, you know, I want to make a difference in um, the livelihood of everybody or the well-being of certain people, you can work behind the scenes. You can work at Micron and make the chips that pr then provide to that industry. So. And if I was talking to a kid like that, I would tell them the science is spectacular, the engineering is spectacular, and once you do that, you can do anything. And just look at some of these people. We just saw Senator Padilla, mechanical engineer, now having impact on the national level. Many of you may not know this, but represent, Representative Ocasio-Cortez was an Intel science competition finalist when she was in high school, right? You can see a picture of her on their website, right? So, and of course, she's gone on to do very different things, but doing that science and technology at a young age enabled her and, and probably many, many of the rest of us to just do amazing things, maybe even outside science and technology. I will also add that at Great Minds in STEM, when it comes to our K-12 outreach programs, we demystify STEM. We, we make it very relatable from the time you get up in the morning and brush your teeth. A chemist came up with that formula, and manufacturing engineers actually packaged it and had it delivered. And so there's STEM in everything that we do, our alarm clocks, the cars. STEM is just already makes our world viable, possible, and um, accessible. And so it's already a part of our lives. So what part of it makes sense for you? Good morning, everyone. So um, each of you have spoke about the importance of money and the financial assistance, right, in some form or fashion. And I think we always look, when we talk higher education, we immediately think scholarships. But I'm curious about your thoughts between the difference of impact between scholarships and loan repayment concepts. And does one demonstrate a higher degree completion? And Chris, this may be more targeted towards you, but I know both of your companies also support scholarships in the community as well. So I'm curious, um, uh, just thoughts on that and, and, and what you've seen. I mean, I, I think that uh, I don't know the details on, on the advantages between loan repayment versus scholarships, those kinds of things. Um, I think loan repayments in technical fields can be very effective because the salaries are typically high. Um, and although I just have to remind people that, you know, you know, we heard about these weed out situations, right, that that can then leave, leave a student burdened afterwards if they don't complete the degree. But I think there are, you know, definitely ways of encouraging. The salaries are definitely already encouraging, um, but maybe things we can do even at a younger, at a younger level to make sure those kids are, are interested and prepared to, to get that scholarship or that loan repayment when they get into college. Yeah, I would agree. I think uh, financial literacy, I shared my own personal experience. My daughter, 4.0, valedictorian at her school, right? Didn't fill out any scholarships. So she's not getting any big money, right? And she's wanted to go forensic science, right? Um, and just explaining the importance of it and making sure that, hey, this is out here, you just have to go get it. Uh, and there's companies that will do these things, right? Um, as far as loan repayment, I think that would be something that would encourage students to stay in school, right? Because I know two years in, you're like, oh, I already got $50,000 worth of debt. Jobs out here looking crazy. I don't know what I'm gonna do. You might drop out jump into the workforce and say, I'll come back later. So I think that's something that we do need to look at. And maybe that's something that I can look into myself for, for future at Dell, because I do have, do have a little bit of pull in making things like that happen. Love to talk to you. <laughs> well, well, then let's talk. Let's talk. <laughs> I don't really have much more to add. I know Micron does, um, uh, what is it called? educational reimbursements. So uh, at Micron, we can take uh, classes related to our field, and Micron will pay up to a certain amount of credits per semester if they want to continue their education. So I that's think, more along the lines of professional development? Uh, yes, yes. But you can take um, more like technical classes as well, not just, you know. Um, I don't know, business classes or anything else. Um, I, don't, I don't have much more else Upskilling. to say. Upskilling. Yeah. Excellent. 
Well, thank you for joining us for this very engaging, informative session. And, and let's give a round of applause to all of our panelists.